And fundamentally, it's a way for humans to fuel their brains. And the problem is, you know, we store our, our, our majority of our fuel in adipose tissue. And the problem is the brain can't use fat in that form. So when we're breaking down adipose tissue, releasing fatty acids at a high rate, and that those fatty acids are taken up by the liver and essentially exceeding the liver's capacity to oxidize those fatty acids, we have this pathway by which they can be converted into ketones. And this occurs primarily in the liver. So we're converting those uh, fatty acids, partially breaking them down into smaller molecules called ketones. And our two primary ketones are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. They're four carbons. And unlike fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, these ketones can in fact be taken up by the brain and used as fuel. So that's how we use fat for fuel in order to ensure a stable fuel source for the brain. And once they're taken up, they're, they're oxidized and converted back to acetyl-CoA and generate ATP. And we actually knew all this metabolism 50 years ago. George Cahill at Harvard performed cutting edge research studying starvation uh, ketosis. And it's true, uh, if, you're, um, if you're consuming carbohydrate as a primary nutrient, your brain depends on glucose as an energy source. It needs about 150 grams of glucose per day just to function normally. But if you're in ketosis, and Cahill showed this with very uh, invasive arterial venous different studies um, across the brain looking at um, healthy adults who had been starved for up to four weeks and showed that the brain can extract up to two thirds of its energy from ketones, dramatically reducing its glucose requirements. You know, that, that metabolic knowledge has been available. We just really haven't taught healthcare professionals uh, this. So uh, when we're distinguishing different states of ketosis, concentrations really matter a lot. So it's important to understand, you're all producing ketones right now, no matter if you just ate a bagel or a muffin. Uh, your liver is still producing ketones, albeit at a very low rate. Now, when you restrict carbohydrates for most people uh, to say under 50 grams per day, that metabolic machinery starts to kick into gear and you will see ketone levels increase by an order of magnitude from say 0.1 millimolar all the way up to one, perhaps up to three or four millimolar. So that's a tenfold increase and that's the range we call nutritional ketosis. And while that is an order of magnitude higher than what you would see in the carb-fed state, it's actually an order of magnitude lower than what you see in ketoacidosis. And that is a dangerous, life-threatening situation. So it's really understanding the magnitude here. When we get into nutritional ketosis, we consider that an optimal range of ketosis. And when you stay in that range for several weeks and months, the body fundamentally goes through adaptations to maintain near perfect interorgan fuel exchange. Uh, but we know fundamentally what happens when you're keto adapted is you become very proficient at burning fat. Your rates of fat oxidation double. And that's true if you're a type two diabetic or if you're an elite ultra endurance athlete, you will essentially double your rate of fat burning. So again, we knew all that. Um, we knew most of all that for, for decades. What's newer in the science of, of ketosis over the last six, seven years is the understanding now that beta-hydroxybutyrate in particular is a potent signaling molecule. Uh, we worked out a lot of the mechanisms here. For one, it's a potent histone deacetylase inhibitor that is a primary way in which we upregulate expression of genes. Uh, it also inhibits uh, other pathways in cells that are related to inflammation and oxidative stress. There were actually two separate groups working independently on longevity experiments uh, that started about three years ago and, the, and both published their results simultaneously in cell metabolism about six months ago. And interestingly, both studies found more or less the same thing, that mice fed ketogenic diets not only lived longer, but had an expanded health span. So they lived healthy longer. They functioned physically better and cognitively had higher levels of neurocognitive performance than mice not in ketosis. And they worked out a lot of the mechanisms. And it turns out, in terms of anti-aging anyway, 
a lot of the same underlying mechanisms that we've uncovered with caloric restriction are mimicked by ketones and ketogenic diets without the caloric restriction. 